So Dr. Phil, Philip Oldfield has uh, over 30 years of experience in service to the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industries, specializing in ligand binding, hybridization acid techniques, and clinical immunology. In the last 10 years, uh, he's worked as an independent scientific regulatory consultant. Uh, he's now retired, uh, both writing and in reviewing technical reports and clinical protocols and NDA submissions. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and associate member of the Royal College of Pathologists till end of 2020 and a member of the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. Dr. Orfield chairs, chaired the Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists Ligand Binding Acid Bioanalytical Focus Group in 2008, involved in scientific and regulatory discussions with the focus group, the US FDA, as well as other regulatory authorities resulting in the publication of white papers, setting the standards for industry. And Dr. Orfield has published 22 peer-reviewed scientific papers, two book chapters, and in excess of 1,500 confidential scientific reports in support of regulatory submissions for the FDA EMA. Dr. Oldfield has also given numerous presentations at major conferences throughout the world on immuno and hybridization assays, clinical immunology, and prion disease. And we could go on, but without further ado, we will I, I get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll go, I'll go to the first slide now. After you've heard all this, you'll find out that I'm not actually going to present something that's going to be highly science So I hope you don't mind. Sarah had asked me to um, look at some master narratives that you see below. And uh, my favourite one is the last one. And because of that, Sarah would have to watch out and check her and check a sort of spell checker before actually sending an email to me. Right, now masks are not uh, a new thing. You've got the plague doctor beak mask, <laughs> which uh, came out in the 1300s during the Black Plague in the UK. And um, of course, if I was faced with the doctor like that with the Black Plague, I'd, I'd probably think I was in hell already. But the mask actually had um, herbs inside the beak because it was uh, considered that the disease was in the miasma in the air. And of course, the more foul smell in the miasma, the worse the disease was. And so I'm just going to go through each of the narratives in turn. Uh, the one where I'm going to be talking about a dirty mask is is, is better than no mask. And the one about oxygen is smaller than a virus, etc. cetera. Um, I'm gonna tackle that in two slides, but they're interrelated. Right, so they say that a picture says it have a thousand words. This picture has got over a thousand people not wearing masks not socially distanced, taking a few months to go and off to work. And one thing that you would notice is that nowhere during the three week period where the demonstrators were not to work, were there any, um, were there any floods of COVID-19 cases in the local hospitals? In fact, you never heard that at all. And in fact, during the, during the three weeks of the peaceful demonstration, um, there was actually practically no injuries. No one knew COVID, no one died of COVID, no one hospitalized with COVID. And, and yet, when the demonstration was broken up, there was actually people in hospital with uh, bruises, lacerations and broken bones. And so when, when you've got this question, my child has not been sick since he started wearing the mask, so it works. I think it's always good to ask questions like, how sick was your child before wearing the mask? Um, children do get sick 
Anyone who's a parent would know that. And children bounce back. And, um, and if your child has not been sick since wearing the mask, and you're going to make your child wear that mask because you don't want them sick, how long are you going to make them wear that mask for? It's going to be longer than during the COVID-19 uh, issue because you don't want your child to get sick from anything. And so I think just looking at this photograph would show that if you don't wear a mask, you're not going to die, you're not going to get seriously sick, and you're not going to go into hospital with COVID. I mean, a certain proportion of people who are more vulnerable, let's say more from the older population, with any disease, even with the flu, can get very sick, and I'm not denying that. But the fact that none of these people are wearing the mask, and none of these people are are greater than two meters apart, uh, has to show you that now that you've got Omicron, um, that uh, why can't life go back to normal? And here's one, even a dirty mask is better than no mask. Now, you might think, what are these two pictures got in common? So you've got a dirty mask on the road, one side, and you've got this nice, bright, shiny, clean uh, biological safety cabinet, class two. Um, and I have to say at this point that I actually helped design it. And it was uh, designed with a double HEPA filter, designed to take out um, the uh, AIDS virus. And the purpose of this robot was to house uh, an electro, uh, house uh, a robotic uh, liquid handling system, and um, and obviously it's to prevent people from the operators from getting infected when when uh, assaying uh, the samples that contain the uh, virus. Now, here's the th here's the thing. Um, you a dirty mask is no is better than a no mask. Um, I would say the opposite was true, and the reason for that is you're wearing a mask. And let's say, for instance, you've got COVID nineteen, and let's say that you sneeze in your mask or you're dripping in your mask and droplets those droplets are going to evaporate. And I know with friends of mine who wear masks that they could wear them for weeks. They wear them and they hang them on the car somewhere and then they put it on again. No one from the government has told them, first of all, how to fit the mask on properly. And secondly, how to dispose of the mask properly. Now these masks should actually be disposed of in the uh, biohazard waste, but they're not. Um, a number of them have actually been thrown out in the street. Um, there was a news article saying that two children have been collecting them up and kudos for the children. Actually, those children were putting their lives at risk because you've got highly concentrated virus in those masks. And so what happens with the dirty mask uh, is that you can concentrate the virus in the mask and then you're constantly breathing it in. So you increase your viral load and you become even more sick. And in fact, um, the data suggests that in areas where you have got mask mandates, the uh, level of infection and the severity of the infection is actually higher. Now, the photograph on the right shows how it should be done. You've got a double HEPA filter. 
what you need to do is a clean change. And so if I was to take that HEPA filter out, out of that biological safety cabinet, I would have concentrated, I would have concentrated the virus on that filter. So what has to happen first before you change, change the filter is that you have to chemically inactivate the virus beforehand by going through a cycle where you actually flood the uh, inside of the fume hood with formalin and exhaust it out. And so when it says the dirty mask is better than no mask, um, I think we can put this one to bed um, for, the, uh, for the safety of the person wearing the mask. I think when it comes to these masks, they have to be properly fitted. And to be honest with you, I am not a suitable candidate for wearing a mask because they've got a beard. And here is an interesting one. And I'm glad that uh, Sarah had, um, had, had pointed this out. And I think this is one that's generally asked. And it's, a, and it's a question that actually not many scientists can answer. Um, oxygen is smaller than the virus. And, they, and the mask blocks to some degree oxygen intake. True. So what is the relevance between the oxygen and the virus particles? Well, it's all got to do with how we breathe. Um, and this is where I know you said to draw a diagram, but really I wouldn't need to have done the cartoon. Um, when you actually breathe in, your diaphragm goes down, which then produces a vacuum in your lungs, which then draws the air in. When you breathe out, your diaphragm goes up and you breathe out. And that is dependent upon air pressure, not the size of the molecule that you're taking in. And so, and so the best way of looking at it is if you were to hold your nose and get a narrow tube and you were to breathe in and out of that narrow tube and hold your nose, you'll find it difficult to actually breathe after a while. And that is what's happening when you're wearing a mask. You're actually, uh, you're actually introducing a resistance where it's gonna take a longer time to um, actually breathe in the same volume. So your lungs are working harder. It's got nothing to do with pore size. And so, and so that's a reason why, for instance, if you happen to suffer from uh, uh, um, sort of, uh, if you happen to suffer, I, I call it emphysema. Um, uh, other people call it chronic obstructive um, pulmonary disease. It's the same thing. But if you happen to suffer from emphysema, or, or, or another lung disorder that happens to make it difficult for you to breathe, then wearing a mask would only make it worse. And then, up, and then it might, and then after a while, you do, you're not going to suddenly pass out with lack of oxygen and die, but you will have less oxygen going into your system, which affects your immune system your ability to fight disease. Um, it means that other organs have to work faster, uh, harder. And so for instance, your heart would have to work harder, et cetera. So all in all, in the long term, it's not a good, it's not a good idea. And so, the, and so when it comes to wearing the mask, um, and I hope I've explained it right, that, um, you know, 
it's hard, it, it is harder to take in oxygen through a mask, but it's not because the size of the oxygen particle, it's got to do with the amount of pressure um, between the outside and the inside of the lungs and how much air you can get in at a unit time. And so the diagram below, well, not a diagram, the histogram below, actually shows the number of deaths that have occurred in Canada. And this, by the way, is an overestimation. Okay, so it's going to be lower than this. It also includes uh, patients who have had comorbidities, etc. When you look at it, over 90% of the deaths have occurred in people who are 60 years or older. So that would include people like me, right? But people who are sort of uh, work, sort of like who are more or less working age or whatever, and certainly students, the numbers are very low. I mean, um, you've got you've had you know between uh, say um, let's say twenty to twenty nine, for instance, you've got one hundred thirteen people who died over a two and a bit year period. That's the period of time we're talking about. And so, to, and if you take all the numbers and work out how many people have died from COVID-19 over the time that the uh, disease has taken place, you would come to a number of about 40 per day in the whole of Canada. Now, to put that in perspective, if you've got people, you have people with, uh, say, known heart conditions, you would have 12 people die per hour with known heart conditions during that same period of time. I mean, that is just, so if you had all the resources for healthcare, where would you put your money? And so this just gives a very balanced view of, um, of and puts it in perspective in terms of the number of deaths. Um, when you listen to the news, you, you sometimes get a very distorted picture when you hear about all these young people dying. Um, but when, when you look at it, I mean, you've got to say, um, uh, uh, 12 to 19 year olds, 12 people died over, over a two year period, over a two year period. Uh, whereas people die of suicide at a rate of 15 per day in Canada. And so that really does put it in perspective. And again, I'd like to also stress that if you're wearing a mask, um, and it does talk about this. Yes, you do restrict the airflow and, and you do get virus particles actually in the mask. If that concentrates, let's say you've got the disease and you're concentrating the virus in your mask, you're then breathing those virons back in. And that would only make your disease a lot worse. If you didn't have the mask, the whole thing would have been over by now because one would have reached you, herd immunity a lot quicker. So, so the best way to reach herd immunity is for people to actually get the disease, uh, assuming, of course, they're not going to die or get very serious and sick. And so, of course, so the younger people it would be to their advantage not to wear masks and to uh, get the disease and then to have a robust immune reaction towards any further infections. Oh yes, here's the one I like. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah, but you're gonna have to check your smelling. 
This is another narrative that keeps on coming up. And I quote, I have an autoimmune condition, so I need to wear the mask. I need otters around me to wear it too. I'm sure they meant others. And here's where, now there's over a hundred autoimmune diseases. Okay. So you've got uh, celiac disease, type one diabetes, psoriasis. So here's, here's just a few I put down. Okay, psoriasis, uh, a thickening of the skin where, where you've got antibody, where you've got uh, your own antibodies actually um, attack the skin. You've got uh, tiligo, which is where antibodies attack the melanin producing cells. So you get white patches on your skin. Hemolytic anemia, antibodies that attack your red blood cells, potentially fatal. Uh, Crohn's disease, where you've got antibodies against the in, in, intestine. Type 1 diabetes, where you've got antibodies against the cells that produce insulin. And so that person is dependent on insulin for life. Graves disease, not to be confused with going to the grave, um, is, a disease, is a disease where you get antibodies against the thyroid, producing high levels of thyroid hormones. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is where you get antibodies against the thyroid that produces that results in low levels of thyroid hormones. And then of course you've got multiple sclerosis, uh, where, the, where you've got antibodies against the myelin sheath of the nerves. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, where the antibody just attacks the nerves itself. And perhaps the most well-known rheumatoid arthritis, where you've got antibodies that attack the, the uh, synovial fluid between the joints. Now, my question would be, if you've got an autoimmune disease, first of all, you need to know which one. And secondly, I cannot see a reason why one should wear a mask anyway for, the, for an autoimmune disease. Uh, bearing in mind, this is actually a common list. And so, but to be fair, there is one instance where I might consider wearing a mask if, if, if not, um, it, you know, not that it would be, not that it would be uh, foolproof, but that it would be um, a, perhaps a responsible thing to do. And that is if someone is um, got cancer, and has just completed their chemotherapy and their, and their uh, white blood cells, et cetera, have gone really low, et cetera, then, then I would say that person who's, who's had chemotherapy might be prone to a very simple infection like cold. And I think the problem you know, when it comes to this sort of thing is, you know, when you've got a um, person, say, uh, got cancer and you've got the grandchildren in with their colds and flu, etc., it might not do grandma any good if she's got cancer and is actually in the middle of chemotherapy. And so, um, so if, if it was a, uh, so, so I found autoimmune condition a bit strange, but I think if it was someone with cancer on chemotherapy, I think I would understand that. And I think the main reason for that is that you don't want to sneeze on them, basically. And I think um, certainly if I had a streaming cold, I would not want to put myself anywhere near someone who might be immunocompromised. And that's it. So let's see if I can stop sharing. <laughs> oh. oh, what have I done? Um, okay, we'll end that.
Oh, yeah. And how do I... Oh, right. Okay. I've stopped sharing now. Yeah, perfect. And uh, maybe we... Oh, yes. Yeah, so we have any questions for that? Curtis, how, how was your... The answer to the autoimmune disease? <laughs> I think that was a question that Curtis had sent me uh, for the airflow. So uh, I'd like Curtis to ask further. <laughs> so you, you're, you're responsible for that one. Okay. Yeah. So the, the airflow thing actually, it came from our first Science Alive uh, meeting where um, Wendy was talking about pore size and how the virus is much smaller than the pores and the mask. Sorry, yeah, much smaller than the pores and the mask. Therefore, the masks don't work because the virus can easily get through. Um, and then at some point, somebody said uh, that they can't breathe when they're wearing a mask. And so that something clicked in my head. I was thinking, okay, well, clearly it's stopping the oxygen from getting in, and it has to do with the airflow. Um, it's, it's preventing the air from getting in. And so clearly small particles and, you know, well, oxygen is not a particle, but oxygen and virus are both being carried by air and yeah. stopping oxygen. It should be stopping the virus too. And I was curious. But it's not so stopping, no, but it's not stopping the oxygen. What it's doing is making it harder but yes. because you've got resistance, I mean, if you were to um, hold your nose and blow and uh, breathe into a small tube um, for any length of time, um, you'll know, even though that tube, the tube diameter is a lot bigger than an oxygen molecule, um, yeah. it's to do with the air pressure. And, yeah. and, and so, and the way that, and it's to do with the way the lungs work. I mean, just to mention, if you've got emphysema, um, or if you've seen someone with emphysema, you might find that when they breathe, they sort of go, and they breathe slower than they talk. And what that does, they're doing it instinctively, it allows the air to stay longer in the lungs to allow exchange to take place. Because when you've got emphysema, you've got all this um, gunk that's between the alveoli and the and the air, and the air. And you don't, whereas a person was to just breathe normally, they'll be breathing in and out with hardly any exchange taking place. And so they literally will be starving themselves of oxygen, even though they'd be breathing pretty hard. And that's why instinctively when they blow out, they tend to blow out a lot slower, uh, et cetera. And it's to do with mechanics more than anything else. So I hope that kind of explains, it's, it's one that I didn't expect many scientists to wanna, would be able to answer because they immediately get their mind set on the size and not on the mechanism by which you breathe. Right, the air pressure thing is so important which people haven't been even made aware of. And I was listening to, I think it's his name is Steve, Stephen Petty, who's yeah. a professional engineer and worked in uh, all this uh, environmental safety. And uh, he was explaining that um, the only ma mass that might be considered a, that they can stop anything would maybe the N95 and only if the N95 is really fitted very, very well, which nobody does do it. And the N95 also writes on its box that it is not to be used on children. Yeah. So now they're talking about using N95 in schools for children. And that is a dangerous thing, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the thing, I mean, when you're a child, I mean, my main concern is that, you know, it's not as if a child's gonna drop down dead because you've got a lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. But if they're over a long period of time, 
yeah. having a lower oxygen tension than what they should have, for instance. In fact, something that one might consider normal, but still low, mm -hmm. it's going to lower your immune system. Yeah. It's going to stop development uh, of your brain, etc. if you're at a very early age. Yeah. Um, and, more, and your heart is going to be working a lot more because um, you, you know, because your body is saying I need more oxygen, but there isn't any there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, uh, and again, it's a risk benefit. I mean, when you take a yeah. look at how many people have died from COVID-19 over a two and a bit year period yeah. of uh, those particular age groups, uh, does it warrant a mask mandate for that particular age group? Well, the answer is no. Right. Liam and Corey, do you have any questions? Yeah. When does hypoxia kick in? <laughs> when you pass out. <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Some people would take it at a certain oxygen tension, okay? I mean, you could give a value to say anything below 85 um, oxygen tension would be, yeah. uh, uh, would be uh, not good. Um, do we know of, of uh, is it a widespread phenomenon or has it occurred that that people are passing out because of the way they're wearing uh, their mask. I, I, I'm. I, I, I I've not. I've not heard of it. I mean, I don't think it's gonna. I don't think it's gonna restrict it that much, in terms of. But I would be more concerned about the chronic use of the mask over a long period of time, and. Um, as I said, you know, if you do find it difficult to breathe, um, then that is the telltale sign there's something wrong. Mm 